Ireland. Um, yeah, so I will be speaking to the panel theme from the perspective of a research project that uh, I work on together with Stefan and with Chris. And the project looks at the role of pharmaceuticals in security. So it's a bit broader than uh, the, the issue of genomics and genetics, but of course genomics and genetics play an important role in the creation of pharmaceuticals. And I will sort of highlight that in my presentation. So we have heard quite a bit today already about how the rise of genetics and genomics has shaped the perception of threats that are related to health, including the perception of uh, security threats that sort of how governments perceive them. And um, for example, we have heard about how the ability to manipulate pathogens can make them more dangerous or also the natural mutation of pathogens can create security threats. What I want to um, talk to is a slightly different perspective, is that the rise of genetics and genomics has shaped also the responses of governments to those uh, security threats. <coughs> A key element in the response um, that we observe, in the government response that we have observed to the new health security threats, is um, pharmaceutical intervention. So what we've seen is that in response to um, a rise of health security threats in the 1990s, governments have started to stockpile existing medicines and vaccines, and where medicines and vaccines did not exist that were deemed useful for these new threats, they have invested in the development uh, of new medicines and vaccines. And um, finally, uh, governments in some areas like pandemic influenza have also invested in international programs to make pharmaceuticals more widely available. Uh, one example for that is the uh, Global Action Plan uh, for Pandemic Influenza Vaccines that's run through uh, the World Health Organization. So in other words, what we observe as a key um, theme in the government response, government's responses to health security threats, is the conception of pharmaceuticals as a new security technology. And this new security technology has been given a name, which is medical countermeasures. So medical countermeasures is a term for drugs and vaccines that are deemed useful to counter health-related security threats. In order to um, conceptually grasp this development in, in health security policy, we have used the term <coughs> pharmaceuticalization of security. And for those of you who are interested in, in learning a bit more about that, we have um, explained it a bit more in, in two publications that have come out over the year, in this year. So let me say a little bit about the role of genetics and genomics in the pharmaceuticalization of security. I'll say something first about sort of how the science of genetics and genomics shape uh, the pharmaceuticalization and security potentially, and then a little bit about the political economy of it. So in terms of, of the scientific advancements, essentially genetics and genomics allow us quite unparalleled insights into how diseases work. So the pathogenesis of diseases. And secondly, they have the potential and in some areas have already achieved the development of new types of medicines and vaccines. Very briefly, um, if we want to develop a new drug or vaccine, we have to understand how a disease works, in the how the pathogen works and how the human body works and how they interact together. So by giving us, and, and sort of the, these, these biological processes of disease, they are shaped by the genes, the genes of both the pathogen and the human body. So by genomic analysis of both microbes, um, viruses, bacteria, and also the human genome, we can learn much more about, say, how a virus replicates, which part of a virus triggers uh, an immune response in the human body, for instance, 
and that can give us insights or ideas about what kind of molecule we need to design to prevent the virus from replicating, for example, or from which part of the virus uh, we need to enhance so to, to trigger a, a, an immune response in the human body. And the same uh, when we study um, the, the, the human genome, we can learn about how the immune response uh, works in the human body, where a vaccine, for example, can uh, target the human response, the immune response to trigger it and make it stronger. So, genetics and genomics can, they don't have to, but they can make the identification and the development of new drugs and vaccines faster and potentially also more effective. It's a potential. It's not like it's not a given, but it's, it's a potential. As I said before, um, genetics and genomics can also help us uh, develop new uh, medicines and vaccines. And again, they have the potential to be uh, more effective, have fewer side effects, and be faster to produce than what we can do with conventional methods. For example, um, uh, a vaccine against pandemic influenza that was licensed last year, which is based on RDNA technology, uses <coughs> only those parts of the virus that trigger the human uh, immune response without actually using that part of the virus that triggers the disease. So in that way, you can, from this vaccine, not uh, become ill which is often a concern with, with vaccination. And also, the technology they use for producing this virus allows it to scale up the production of this, uh, of this vaccine much faster and in much greater volumes in case of a pandemic than what would be possible with conventional method, methods. So there's a lot of potential here, some of which seems to be already uh, becoming a reality. Um, but uh, yeah, so genetic and genomics definitely have the potential to make medical countermeasures more effective. Now I want to move on to the political economy of genetics and genomics in the context of health security policy. So medical countermeasures are demanded, requested um, by governments. But it is not governments who produce the pharmaceuticals that they require. Rather, most of the pharmaceutical development and production, particularly in the field of biotechnology, takes place in the private sector by commercially operating companies. So what I'm saying is that by declaring certain types of pharmaceuticals a new security technology, governments are making themselves dependent <coughs> on private companies to supply, to supply them. The problem seems to be that quite frequently uh, pharmaceutical companies have not been overly enthusiastic about supplying these uh, medicines and vaccines, simply because the market for these pharmaceuticals isn't great. And particularly it isn't great when you compare it to the opportunity to, to investments they could make in developing a new vaccine or a new therapeutic for, say, a new cancer, for, for a new cancer drug or for a diabetes drug, something where a, a very large, a very secure private market exists. With regards to medical countermeasure, your main customer will be governments, which is not ideal from the perspective of a commercially operating organization because governments have first a huge market power. They will be able to, to consider, put considerable price pressure. They usually are under considerable budgetary constraints, um, which doesn't make the market particularly attractive. And also the insecurity of whether the threats will ever materialize uh, creates it very difficult to, to make any market forecasts. So, how have governments tried to get pharmaceutical companies to invest in medical countermeasures nevertheless? Essentially, they have tried um, a range of incentives, um, which can be sort of divided into two main categories. One is so-called pull incentives, which is essentially various measures to create a market where there's none or a very small one. Or they have used, used so-called push incentives, 
which are essentially designed to lower the costs and or the risks for, for companies to invest in, in, in these products. And there have been some successes with this approach. So we have a new influenza, pandemic influenza vaccine, we have new pharmaceuticals for anthrax, smallpox. My impression is though that the successes are mainly in the areas where costs and risks were relatively low from the, from the start, meaning where we knew already quite a lot about the disease and we often even had drugs that we could sort of walk on to improve them rather than to develop them from scratch. And another area that seems to be quite successful is the field of influenza because medical countermeasures are required for pandemic influenza. There is, however, also the market for seasonal influenza, which is commercially not unattractive. So for companies, there is a, is a, is a, there is a commercial opportunity in pandemic influenza, which is greater than in some, uh, some other medical countermeasures. Uh, uh, yeah. So <coughs> despite the successes, my impression is that the challenges actually prevail for this, for this model. Of, uh, getting, of trying to incentivize uh, commercial companies to produce medical countermeasures needed for security. The challenges are around budgetary pressures about relatively short political cycles with, which clash with the very long cycles of pharmaceutical development and again and again the high opportunity costs for commercially operating companies. Um, we ran in the project a roundtable discussion with um, industry and government representatives earlier in the year where this, this sort of the issue of the, the problems of this approach were discussed quite extensively. And you can, if you're interested, you can download the report and I think it's also in your conference pack. So let me conclude with... Um, what I think emerges is one uh, a, a sort of finding from, from our research so far, which is a tension in global health security. On the one hand, we see a policy response to health security threats that relies increasingly on pharmaceuticals, on medical countermeasures. This pharmaceuticalization of security, as we, we call it, conceives of, a, of certain medicines and certain vaccines as part and parcel of a public good, namely security. This policy response, underlying this policy response, however, is a political economy of pharmaceutical production and development, which conceives of pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical products as private goods. So we have a tension here between the certain policy development and the underlying political economy, which sort of is essentially about whether we regard pharmaceuticals in general, or at least certain types of vaccines and medicines, as private goods or as public. 